over on JG9 News, we have a lot of new videos out. Make sure to check the link in the description to find out more and subscribe now to JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. January 12th, 1997. We're up in Foxborough for the AFC Championship between the New England Patriots and the Jacksonville Jaguars. For one of these teams, their season is going to extend for one more game, as they'll head down to New Orleans for the Super Bowl. For the Patriots, if they win, it's their second appearance in the big game, and their first since the 1985 season, when they played in Super Bowl XX. For the Jaguars, if they win, it will complete the greatest turnaround in NFL history, as an expansion team in their second season, and 4-7 and seven at one point, would have somehow made it to the Super Bowl in a result that no one saw coming whatsoever. It's win or go home for the right to take on the Green Bay Packers at Super Bowl 31. And on this day, it was the Patriots who came out on top, ending Jacksonville's Cinderella story by defeating the Jaguars 20-6. The Jags turned it over four times, including late down by the goal line, and just made too many mistakes to win the contest, as the Pats had the lead the entire time, including the moment when the lights went out displaying just how run-down and outdated Foxborough Stadium truly was. However, while it was a joyous day for the Patriots and their fans, as they were advancing to the Super Bowl, as head coach Bill Parcells, in a matter of four years, turned the worst team in football and the laughing stock of the league into an AFC champion, it was not a joyous day for all of their fans. Because you see, the process for getting tickets to Segi was nothing short of disastrous. The 1996 AFC Championship, this game right here, was the first time ever that New England had hosted the conference championship before, so they had no idea what they were doing, and had no idea how to respond to demand for this all-important game. And it showed, as the process for buying tickets was so disastrous that property was damaged, misinformation spread, fights broke out, and people even got arrested. It turned very violent very quickly. It was a complete and utter train wreck. And I did a video about that a while ago. So you can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But I bring that up because one decade later, in January of 2007, the Patriots were mainstays in the AMC Championship. It was a rather ho-hum experience for them under head coach Bill Belichick and quarterback Tom Brady as they were in the middle of one of the greatest dynasties that the sport had ever seen. It was a been-there-done-that sort of affair, as the team got more experience playing in and hosting AFC Championship games, including this game right here, when they traveled on the road to play in the semifinals. But the home team for this game? As in, the Indianapolis Colts? Not so much. They were the Patriots back in 1996. They were the team that had never done this before. They were the team that had never hosted the conference championship and had no idea what to do. And man, did it show! Because when it was announced that the Indianapolis Colts were hosting this game and were hosting the final game before the Super Bowl, they really had no idea what to do. And what followed was a disaster that lives on more than a decade and a half later and embodies everything that a team should not do when hosting a conference championship. Because to say that this process ticked off fans and ticked off everyone would be putting it lightly. Because this is the story behind the disaster at the 2006 AFC Championship. In the middle of the night on March 28, 1984, the Baltimore Colts, in Mayflower trucks, packed their bags and moved to Indianapolis. This was the first time that Indianapolis had a pro football team, as after three decades in Baltimore and tons of success in that city, including three world titles, including Super Bowl V during the 1970 season and back-to-back -back NFL championship wins in 1958 and 1959, the Baltimore Colts were no more. And there are some teams that experience tons of success right off the bat after relocating. The Houston Oilers moved to Tennessee in 1997. By the third year that they were in the state, they were already playing for the Super Bowl, when they made it to Super Bowl 34. The Cleveland Browns moved to Baltimore in 1996 in a highly complicated process. Five years later, they were world champions, 
winning Super Bowl 35 over the New York Giants in a game that you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Even in other sports, you see this happen a lot. In baseball, the Kansas City Athletics moved to Oakland to become the Oakland Athletics in 1968. By the end of their seventh season in the Bay Area, they had won three straight World Series titles and were one of the greatest dynasties in baseball history. In basketball, the Seattle Supersonics moved to Oklahoma City in 2008. Four years later, they were playing in the NBA Finals as Western Conference champions. You get the idea. Sometimes, cities with new teams get success right off the bat. Indianapolis was, uh, yeah, they were not one of them. From 1984 to 2005, in the 22 seasons that the Colts had played in the Hoosier State thus far, they were a pretty bad football team for the vast majority of it. It took the Colts until 1995 for them to even so much as win a playoff game in Indianapolis. And you can learn more about that playoff game, which was a win in the wildcard round, by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Only twice had they made it to the conference championship, making it in 1995 and 2003. They lost both of those times, with one being a loss to the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the other being a loss at the hands of the New England Patriots. Even though the Colts were starting to become a consistently good team, with Tony Dungy at head coach and Peyton Manning at quarterback, there was something that had eluded them that just about every other team in the conference had by this point. A conference championship hosting responsibility. For the first 22 years of their existence, the Hoosier Dome, or the RCA Dome, or whatever you wanted to call it, had never hosted a conference championship. I know it might seem hard to believe nowadays, when it feels like for the last decade and a half or so, the conference championship has pretty much exclusively been played in New England, Kansas City, or Denver. But for the most part, the AFC championship was played all across the country for those 22 years. In that time span from the time that Indianapolis got a team until the end of the 2005 season, Buffalo, Miami, New England, Jacksonville, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Oakland, Denver, and Los Angeles, which didn't even have a team at this point, had all hosted the game. That's 10 different cities, and that's not including Baltimore and San Diego, which hosted it before that time frame, and Seattle, which hosted the 2005 Embassy Championship after the Seahawks played in the AFC for all but one season prior to 2002. In other words, Indianapolis had no experience hosting this game. This was unfamiliar territory for them. So if the Colts were to somehow make the AFC Championship and host it, then they would have to come up with a game plan, because they were truly starting from scratch. Now that's not to say that Indianapolis hadn't had opportunities to potentially host the game. Heck, the previous year in 2005, it looked like a near guarantee that the Colts were going to do it. They ended the season with a 14-2 record. They looked like the best and most dominant team in football. They had the number one seed in the conference, and in the divisional round, they were going up against the Pittsburgh Steelers, the number six seed, and a team that not even two months before, they completely and utterly destroyed. When, on Monday Night Football, in front of a national television audience, the Colts defeated the Steelers 26-7. The Colts were eight and a half point favorites to win this game, and host their first conference championship since moving to Indianapolis. But in a stunning upset, the Steelers prevailed, winning it 21-18 thanks to three things in particular. A hot start, where the Steelers led 14-0 after the first quarter, a shoestring tackle by Ben Roethlisberger to save a surefire touchdown after a Jerome Bettis fumble at the goal line, and idiot kicker Mike Vanderjack shanking a 46-yard field goal that was closer to Baltimore, where the Colts used to play, than it was to splitting the uprights. So if the Colts had never made it to the AFC Championship before, even in 2005, when it seemed written in the stars for Peyton Manning and company to do this, it surely wasn't going to happen in this season, 2006. After the Colts won the AFC South with a 12-4 record and entered the postseason as the number three seed in the conference, they needed three things to happen in order to host the AFC Championship with the three things varying in terms of probability and likelihood. Number one, they had to win their wildcard round game at home against the Kansas City Chiefs. Number two, they had to win their divisional round game on the road against the number two seeded Baltimore Ravens. And number three, 
they had to hope that the number one seeded San Diego Chargers somehow, after a 14-2 season, lost their divisional round game at home, either against the New England Patriots or the New York Jets, meaning that the number one and number two seeds would both be out of the picture, and the Colts, as the number three seed, could swoop in as the remaining high seed and host the AFC Championship. The odds of all three things happening according to the Vegas odds were plus 957, meaning that if you were to bet 10 bucks on a scenario where the Colts host of the conference championship, you would win $957.25. If you won it as a percentage, you are looking at about a 9% chance that the Colts would actually host the scheme. That's not a high number by any means, but that's looking at things from a pure numbers standpoint. That's looking at things without any sort of lens as to what's actually happening. Because in reality, the odds probably weren't at 9%. They were way lower. In 1990, the NFL expanded the playoffs to the format that we knew of at the time, where six teams in each conference made the playoffs. Under this system, the number one seed and the number two seed got a first round bye, with the number three seed playing the number six seed and the number four seed playing the number five seed in the first round. Prior to this, the number three seed had a first round bye, because five teams in each conference made it, with the two wild cards playing each other on wild card weekend. This meant that only two things had to happen for the number three seed to host the conference championship, which was that they won their game, and the other team, whether it was the number one seed or the number two seed, due to rules saying that the number one seed couldn't play the wild card if it was a team in their own division, lost their game. But now, with the format being the way it was beginning in 1990, and at this point in 2006, three things had to happen. And in the first 16 years of this playoff format, from 1990 to 2005, this happened a grand total of zero times. So the odds were stacked against this team right here that you've been watching if they were going to do this and host the game. There were 32 opportunities, so 16 in the AFC and 16 in the NFC, for the number three seed to host the conference championship, meaning that they hosted the wildcard round, went on the road for the divisional round, and then came back home for the conference championship. And all 32 times, it didn't happen. All 32 times, either the number one seed or the number two seed hosted the game. That's not to say we hadn't come close to it happening before. In 1993, the number three seeded Kansas City Chiefs made it to the AMC Championship by defeating the number two seeded Houston Oilers. And in the other game, the number one seeded Buffalo Bills troubled Los Angeles Raiders in the fourth quarter. However, the Bills prevailed and won 29-23 meaning that the conference championship was hosted at Orchard Park. In 2003, the number three seeded Indianapolis Colts made it to the AFC Championship by defeating the number two seeded Kansas City Chiefs. And in the other game, the number one seeded New England Patriots were tied with the number five seeded Tennessee Titans with five minutes left in the game. However, the Pats won 17 to 14, and Foxborough hosted the AFC Championship. And in what had to be, by far, the closest instance of this happening at this point, that same year in the NFC, the number three seeded Carolina Panthers made it to the NFC Championship by defeating the St. Louis Rams, and were one play away from hosting, when the number one seeded Philadelphia Eagles trailed the number four seeded Green Bay Packers 17 to 14, and the Eagles were faced with fourth and 26 late in the contest. Somehow, they converted it, they forced overtime, and they won the game making it the second straight year that the conference championship was in Philadelphia. But even though we had come close, it was with no cigar. The numbers do not lie. Zero successes in 32 tries. The odds that this team you've been watching this whole time, the Colts, would actually host the AFC championship, I cannot stress enough, were incredibly slim, to the point where they might as well have been non-existent. But okay. Step one in the equation, the Colts have to beat the Chiefs. This was going to be an extremely tough battle for the Colts, because the Chiefs made it to this point on the strength of their great running game. Not counting with Danny and Tomlinson, who maybe had the greatest season by any running back of all time, the Chiefs had the best running back in football in 2006 in this man right here, Larry Johnson. He was named an AP First Team All-Pro by picking up 1,789 rushing yards 
and 17 rushing touchdowns, both of which ranked second in the league. When the Chiefs had 150 or more rushing yards in a game, they were 6-0. This was their bread and butter, and this was how they won football games. They had to win their final two games of the season to have even the slightest chance at making the playoffs. And they did, picking up 320 rushing yards combined in those games. And this is notable because the Colts had one of the worst run defenses in NFL history. I'm not kidding. Your dead grandma could run on this Colts defense, which finished dead last in the league in rushing yards allowed and dead last in the league in yards for carry allowed. The average team in the league allowed 1,876 rushing yards in 2006. The Colts allowed 2,768. That was 441 yards more than the next worst defense. The average team in the league allowed 4.2 yards per carry in 2006. The Colts allowed 5.3, nearly half a yard worse than the next worst team, and more than a full yard above the league average. The Colts allowed over 100 rushing yards in every single game during the 2006 season, and perhaps most notably, in Week 14, in a 44-17 loss to the Jacksonville Jaguars, they allowed a whopping 375 rushing yards. For some perspective, the Minnesota Vikings allowed 61.5 rushing yards per game in 2006. During the Jaguars-Colts game, the Colts allowed 93.8 rushing yards per quarter. Per quarter. And entering the playoffs, over in these final six games, they allowed 1,217 rushing yards, or 203 yards per game. Abysmal. Just abysmal. No chance they can beat the Chiefs and their incredible ground game, right? Well, somehow, they did. Because not only did the Colts win it 23-8, but they held the Chiefs' running game completely in check in what might be the most shocking defensive performance in playoff history. I don't think anyone saw it coming, where Larry Johnson would be held to just 32 yards rushing on under 3 yards a carry, and where the Chiefs would be held to 44 rushing yards on the day. For some perspective on how good the Colts were on this day defensively, and just how shocking this was in the eyes of many, here's a look at every single game the Colts played in 2006 up until that point, and how many rushing yards they allowed in each of them. That Chiefs game in the red bar? That is in another stratosphere in all the best ways. It's more than double their next best game. It didn't matter that Peyton Manning wasn't on his game, throwing three interceptions. The defense, which allowed just seven first downs, 126 yards of offense, and nothing on the ground, absolutely balled out. Part one, done. Now, it was time for part two. The Colts had to go on the road and take on the Baltimore Ravens, as in, the team with the best defense in football. The 2006 Ravens have a case for being one of the most underrated defenses of all time, and it's not hard to see why. Heck, some people think they were better than the 2000 Ravens. They finished the season first in the league in points allowed, first in rushing yards allowed, first in interceptions, first in rushing touchdowns allowed, second in rushing yards allowed, second in turnovers forced, and second in yards per carry allowed. Just about every major stat, the Ravens were inside the top two, and they entered the playoffs having allowed just 64 points over their last seven games, or about nine points per game. On top of that, the Ravens were a red-hot team, making it easy to see why they were favored to win. They won four straight games and nine of their last ten. And M&T Bank Stadium, the site of the scheme, was an absolute fort for Baltimore, as dating back to 2005, the Ravens had won 11 of their last 12 games played at home. No team had a better home field advantage than Baltimore, so no chance the Colts win this one, right? Well, even though the Colts did not score a single touchdown on the day, even though Peyton Manning's playoff struggles continued, as he threw no touchdowns and two interceptions and completed just 50% of his passes, and even though the Colts couldn't establish the ground game whatsoever, as they averaged just 2.8 yards per carry, with 25% of their rushing yards coming on one play, it didn't matter, because the Colts pulled off the stunning upset and won it 15-6 in what might be the greatest playoff game by any kicker of all time, Adam Vinatieri went 5 for 5, with three of those kicks coming from 40 plus yards out. Indy never trailed at any point, 
and in this battle of nothing but field goals, the Colts prevail, and we're going to advance to the AFC Championship. Somehow, part two done. Now, it was time for part three. This was the part completely out of Indy's control. If they were going to host the AFC Championship, they needed the San Diego Chargers to lose to the New England Patriots. San Diego entered this game with a 14-2 record, having won 10 straight to get to this point. They had the number one offense in the league, thanks to the play of their Pro Bowl quarterback, Phillip Rivers, but most importantly, the play of their future Hall of Fame running back, hosting maybe the greatest season of all time, LaDainian Tomlinson, who had 1,815 rushing yards and an NFL record 28 rushing touchdowns, both of which led the league. The Chargers were undefeated at home, and looked destined to make it to the conference championship for the first time under veteran head coach Marty Schottenheimer. And unfortunately for the Colts, this is where our story ends. Because the Chargers had a 21-13 lead with 6 minutes left in the game, and with San Diego up by 8, the Patriots were faced with 4th and 5 near midfield, in a play that might ultimately decide their season. Tom Brady's pass gets intercepted by Marlon McCree, which was probably not the smart play, seeing as it actually cost the Chargers some field position, and he should have batted it down. However, that was it. The AFC Championship was set. The Indianapolis Colts playing the San Diego Chargers in California at Qualcomm Stadium for a spot at Super Bowl 41. The Indianapolis Colts going on the road, like every other number three seed before them to make it to the stage to play in the conference chip. Tapped for the third time, and the ball comes out. Troy Brown reached in there and knocked the ball loose. Can you believe it? Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Yep. You already know how this one ends. The Patriots score a touchdown and get the two-point conversion. They get a stop. The Pats drive down the field again and hit the go-ahead field goal to take a 24-21 lead. And when the Chargers can't score on their final drive following a missed field goal, for the fourth time in the last six years, the New England Patriots are heading back to the AFC Championship in the most anticipated installment of the Tom Brady vs. Peyton Manning rivalry yet absolute jubilation around Indianapolis. For the first time in NFL history, a number three seed was hosting the conference championship. For the first time ever, Indianapolis was hosting the conference championship. It took over two decades, but they were finally going to have their moment. It took an almost improbable set of circumstances for it to happen. It took maybe the worst run defense in NFL history to absorb the powers of the 85 Bears Space Jam style against one of the best running backs in football, took a stunning win against the number one defense in the league that never lost at home, and took a 14-2 team that was undefeated at home to choke an eight-point lead with six minutes left by making one of the most boneheaded errors in NFL history by trying to intercept this ball in the first place, and then not going down afterwards. It had finally sunk in. Indianapolis was hosting the AMC Championship. And then... For the Colts officials, it hit them. Holy crap, we're hosting the AFC Championship. What the heck do we do? Before going any further than we've already gone, there's two things to keep in mind. Number one, I truly cannot stress enough just how little anyone thought that Indy was going to host the AFC Championship game. Not even Indianapolis planned for the contingency that the Colts could be playing this game right here at the RCA Dome. That same weekend of the AFC Championship, the city was hosting this thing right here, Jamfest Cheer Super Nationals, which was the second largest annual cheer competition in the United States. And over 9,000 people were expected to attend the event from all across the country. This meant that all of the hotels were booked, with Bob Schultz, the spokesman for the Indianapolis Convention and Visitors Association, saying on this, There should be plenty of rooms available, just not downtown. That's not exactly the greatest statement in the world. Sure, there are hotels available, but there aren't any hotels that you'll be interested in, or that are convenient. It's like saying if the AMC Championship was in Jacksonville, there are going to be hotels in Jacksonville, just not, you know, hotels in Jacksonville. Not exactly convenient by any means, but whatever, that's not the concern here. 
The point is that Indy truly did not see this coming, as they did not even entertain the possibility that a cheerleading competition could interfere with the biggest game in franchise history, and that anyone coming from out of state for this could be completely screwed trying to find accommodations. And number two, the RCA Dome is insanely small. The average NFL game drew over 65,000 spectators in 2006, but dead last in attendance, averaging just 57,144 fans per game, you had the Indianapolis Colts. It wasn't because of a lack of fan support or anything along those lines. The RCA Dome was just that small, and that was one of the reasons why the Colts were set to leave the Dome in 2008 to go into their brand new state-of-the-art stadium, Lucas Oil Stadium, because right now, they were playing in the smallest stadium in the NFL by a lot, the only one to hold under 60,000 spectators. What does this mean for the purposes of our story? Well, it means that there were very few tickets available for this game right here. It would have been a small number of tickets regardless of how big the stadium was, but the fact that it was the smallest venue in the NFL and they had never hosted a conference championship before? Oh, this was going to be a bloodbath to get the remaining tickets to this game that no one thought the Colts even had a shot at hosting in the first place because everything suggested otherwise based off previous history. With all of that in mind, Cole officials had to figure out a plan to distribute the remaining tickets for the scheme. There were 1,000 tickets left, and each person could buy a maximum of six tickets, which seems on the high side, seeing as a lot of places were restricted to four, but still, nothing out of the ordinary just yet. Now, how are you going to sell these 1,000 tickets to fans? Remember, you had no real contingency plan whatsoever. You weren't even expecting to host this game in the first place, and you had no idea until 7 o'clock local time on Sunday that you were going to do this. So the Colts scrambled and came up with what seems like, quite possibly, the dumbest solution possible. In a logical world, you would wait in line, and the first person in line would get tickets. Then the second person in line will get tickets, and you get the picture. In other words, the way that every other team does it, where a line forms, and once you're at the front of the line, you get to buy your tickets. Any other way where you mess with the foundation of the queue, and you know that the Brits are going to revolt. Heck, if they knew this was happening, the NFL International Series might not come to London in 2007, that's all I'm saying. And if the Colts did that, then no issue whatsoever. This is a complete non-story. People line up to get their tickets, and then, if there are tickets left when they're at the front of the line, they're good. This is also a good system because it allows for congestion to not form outside the booth, because you can have someone monitoring the line whose job it is to know when a certain number of people are in line, meaning that past this point, it will be impossible to buy tickets. The Colts, however, decided not to do that because they decided to break the traditional mold and decided that the best way to determine who gets tickets to this game would be through wristbands. Seriously, freaking wristbands. How it worked was that tickets would go on sale at 10 a.m. on Monday, January 15th. Beginning at 8.30, fans surrounding the dome would be issued wristbands, with each wristband having a number on it. If your number got called, then you guys would go to the booth and buy your tickets. And I don't mean that the first person in line got the number one, the second person got the number two, and then the Colts called out the number one and the number two. The numbers were called out completely randomly via a random number distribution. And I'm sure you can see the many problems with this. Number one, how the heck were Colt fans supposed to know this? Think of anything in society where you have to wait your turn for something. Merging onto a highway during rush hour, waiting in line for a ride at an amusement park, ordering something at McDonald's or a deli or any food establishment. You wait in line and you get to do what you want once you're at the front. You don't wait for the chance to do something. It's not as though you wait in line to merge onto the highway and then a person is calling out randomly which cars can come through. It's not as though you wait in line to order at McDonald's and then a person is calling out randomly which person gets to come to the cash register to make their order. I think it's incredibly reasonable for Colt fans to assume that the team would be selling tickets 
based on who arrived first and who got in line first, and not this insane system that nobody uses. It's almost like if I created a karaoke bar. You would assume how the bar works would be that you sign up for a song, and then you get to sing the song based on the order in which you signed up. You wouldn't assume I use a random number generator to determine the order at when it's your turn to go, meaning that you have no clue whether you're waiting three minutes or three hours. Because when cult fans realized that they were going to host the AMC Championship, they went to the Dome immediately and started gathering outside on Sunday night and in the wee hours of the morning on Monday. The only place where this was advertised as to how the Colts were doing this was the Indianapolis Star. It was not even advertised outside the Dome. But think about it. Not everyone pays for the newspaper. And even if you did, you were probably outside the Dome waiting for tickets before the paper even came to your house. If you arrived at the Dome at 3 o'clock in the morning on Monday, the paper wasn't at your house by that point. The promotion of this was insanely poor, and to make matters worse, the Colts were winging this, because they didn't even tell people who were camped outside the stadium that night that camping out would do absolutely positively nothing. Maybe it would be a bit different if the Colts had signage outside the stadium informing people about this, or if they had a person saying, hey, we're happy that you're interested in buying tickets. Thank you for coming out, but uh, just so you know, we're doing this lottery style. So you're welcome to camp out if you want, but there's no official line. And this doesn't increase your chances at all. So you can go home if you want, you can get some sleep, and you can come back tomorrow. But nope, they didn't do that. They let people line up under the assumption that being first in line meant having a better chance at getting tickets. Because why wouldn't it? That's how society works. Only for them to pull the rug out from underneath them and say, nope, not happening. Number two. If the goal is to eliminate mass crowds and prevent a problem in a mass gathering, congratulations, you created the worst possible system to do it. If you had an actual line system, you could have had someone count how many people were in line so that no more than 1,000 people would be outside the stadium at any given moment. You could send people away once that threshold was hit. You could have told people who arrived afterwards, sorry, we're all sold out. There are no more tickets left and create a situation where you don't have a giant crowd gathering where many people will be upset and frustrated, especially if they got up early to do this and be let down, and especially because it was super cold and super rainy. This was Martin Luther King Day, so for a lot of people, this was their day off and a chance to sleep in and enjoy a three-day weekend. To waste it on this and stand outside in the cold and rain and get sick to get nothing in return? Yeah. People are going to be frustrated, especially compared to the alternative of if you get to the stadium and someone tells you right away that you can't buy a ticket. Instead of having a maximum of 1,000 people gathered outside the stadium at any time, you could have had an unlimited number of people gathered outside. Theoretically, 100,000 people could have gathered outside the stadium, creating a potential mob or crushed scene, which the Colts definitely did not take into account when they designed the system. Plus. There is the possibility with something like this that you run out of wristbands, and then what do you do then? Number three, if the goal is to eliminate scalpers, congratulations, you created the worst possible system to do it. Think about it. What's the one thing that scammers hate more than anything else? Having their time wasted. They don't waste time on people that are going to fall for their scam. If they can sense that things are going in circles, or that you're not going to fall for it, or you don't respond, they'll move on to their next victim. They go for the people that have the high chance of success with as little amount of time as possible to execute the plan. If a scalper had to wait in a line for hours and hours on end in the cold and wet weather, maybe they would be deterred. It's not worth it. I can make money reselling tickets for other events that aren't as time consuming. But under this system, where you can get there at 929, get a wristband, leave and get breakfast, then come back and have your number called, and then if you get your tickets, you've got about 5,000 people waiting outside that will buy your tickets at whatever price you want? Heck yeah! Scalper is going to be all over that system! The barrier for entry is super low! It's a complete joke! And this was ridiculously easy for them, for obvious reasons. 
So let's just recap where we are right now in this story, because it is a doozy and a half. You've got a completely backward system, where the Colts were clearly not prepared, seeing as they had no signage informing people about this, no officials informing people about this, and the only notice was in a newspaper, which is way too late for a lot of people. You've got people camping out outside the stadium, thinking that being first in line was going to help them get tickets to this game even watching this whole time, when that wasn't true. You've got no one telling them about this. You've got a mass crowd gathering outside the stadium that was way more than a thousand people, because you didn't have to be one of the first thousand people or so to have a chance at getting tickets for this game. You've got people who have no idea how the system works, because they were taken completely aback by this format that no one else does. And you've got all of this taking place on a federal holiday, where it was cold and wet and rainy. How the heck do you think this way? Spoiler alert, it did not go well. Tired, ticked, and ticketless. That was the headline front and center in the Indianapolis Star the day after this failure for the game right here occurred. And I promise you that it's even worse than you might be expecting. Because if you're just expecting this to be a bunch of disappointed fans because of how backwards this system was, oh, it was so much worse. To the shock of no one with a brain, this plan failed and ticked off a crap ton of people. Paul Shockley, a 55-year-old Colt fan who is still alive today at the age of 73, was one of the many who were disappointed with how everything went down, saying, It's the dumbest way in the world to do tickets. They lie to the public. Another fan, a 27-year-old by the name of Mitch Isaacs, said on this, It was shady. I just feel like we weren't given all the information. Big time understatement right there. Isaacs was one of the many who lined up super early, arriving at 5 a.m., five hours before the tickets even went on sale. He thought that by getting there early, he had a better chance to get tickets, only for that to be a complete lie. I think it's safe to say that he would have slept in a bit more and gotten there a bit later if he knew that this was how the system was going to go. Now, the Colts defended this strategy, with an official for the Colts saying that this was a completely fair process, with Larry Hall, the vice president of ticket operations for the team, saying on this, We've never had a championship game here at home, so the demand was very high. I mean, duh! I can tell you've never had a championship game at home! Based on this, and how chaotic this was, I can tell you've never done this before! It's like when a person is up there singing a karaoke, and bombs, and doesn't sing clearly into the mic, and says that they've never sang this song before in front of a crowd. Like, it's very obvious. You didn't need to say it. I also love that the defense was, we've never done this before, and there was a lot of demand. Even though, number one, this is the freaking AMC Championship, and there's going to be demand no matter what market it's played in, because it's the second biggest game of the year in the most popular sporting league in the country. So you can't use that as an excuse. And number two, just about every other city and market figured out how to do this without a hitch. You are not unique. You are not special. You, as a professional football team, do not get to use that as an excuse, especially when even season ticket holders got completely screwed over in the process because of your incompetence. Case in point, Ralph Parsley, a 40-year-old Colts fan who didn't renew his season tickets because of how badly the Colts bungled this situation. The Colts emailed him a pre-sale code for the AFC Championship, but the code was invalid. Parsley tried to get the situation rectified, but no one got back to him because they all went home for the weekend. Again, this is the side of a team genuinely not thinking they had any shot at hosting this game and having no game plan whatsoever. The fact that not a single person was in the office that weekend is mind-boggling considering the fact that it was in-season and the Colts still had a chance to host. When they did get back to him on Monday, they said that he was straight out of luck, even though it was their error. Horsley was understandably furious about the whole thing, saying, if you make an error on a season ticket holder, you've got to figure out a way to take care of that person. I'm mad. 
mad enough not to renew my seats. And I don't blame him one bit. That's just inexcusable. It's clear that the Colts had no idea whatsoever what they were doing and were insanely ill-prepared for the AFC Championship and just the possibility that they could host it. But hang on, because it gets even worse. Even worse than the fact that the line stretched for many blocks and thousands upon thousands of people gathered at the Dome to try and buy tickets for this when the crowd should have been eliminated to a thousand people max. And these people were angry. Because what's the magic number that I've said throughout this entire video in terms of how many tickets were available for this game right here that you've been watching? 1,000. 1,000 tickets. You want to know how many people were able to buy tickets? You want to know how many numbers were called? And how many people were able to go to the ticket window? 12! Seriously! A grand total of 12 people! Not even a baker's dozen! The Colts advertised that 1,000 tickets were available, and only 12 people got to make it up there. They either lied, or they significantly miscounted how many tickets were available. Again, each person could buy a maximum of 6 tickets. Let's assume that the dozen people who got to the booth bought the maximum allotment of 6 tickets. Again, that's probably not how it played out, because not everyone is buying 6 tickets and they might just be buying for themselves and their friends or their family. So they might only buy two or four because they're not going to resell the tickets, since they don't know how to scout or don't believe that doing so is legal or moral. But still, let's just play along with this idea that 12 people bought the maximum of six tickets. Do the math, and that means that the Colts, despite advertising that 1,000 tickets were available, sold 72 tickets! 72 tickets out of 1,000. That is 7.2%. And again, that's assuming the max. It was probably lower than that. I mean, that's just insane. No matter how you want to slice it and look at it, that is certifiably insane. Not only did the Colts create a ridiculously convoluted system that made no sense whatsoever, but they ended up confusing themselves in the process by not knowing how many tickets they had on sale. Maybe if someone was working that weekend, they wouldn't have had this issue. This is a professional football team that we're talking about here, folks. And they completely botched this entire situation. Which is a shame, because the game itself was incredible. Seriously, this was one of the greatest playoff games and one of the greatest conference championship games of all time. This was the rivalry between Peyton Manning and Tom Brady at its finest. Because when all was said and done, the Colts won an absolute thriller, as after erasing a 21-3 deficit in the first half, they won it 38-34 on a game-winning touchdown run by rookie running back Joseph Adai with one minute left. I became a football fan personally during the 2004 NFL playoffs. Up until that time, this was the greatest game I had ever seen. It was a bizarre game, where three offensive linemen scored a touchdown, where there were a ton of possessions and opportunities to have the ball and where both offenses seemed to have moments where they were invincible. But after an interception by Marlon Jackson in Colt territory with time running out and the Patriots driving, it was over. The Colts were AFC champions. For the first time since 1970, when they were playing in Baltimore, and for the first time since moving to Indianapolis, they were headed for the Super Bowl. It was off to Miami, where they would try to win their first championship in nearly 40 years and win the first pro sports title for the state of Indiana since the Pacers won the ABA Finals back in the 1972-73 season. It was a thrilling contest with a thrilling conclusion that is still talked about two decades later as being one of the greatest games ever played. Which is why it's a shame that it had to be marred by, well, whatever the heck this ticket debacle was, that never should have happened in the first place. Now, I should note that even though the preparation for the game between these two teams behind me right here was a complete and utter failure, as we've discussed for the last half hour or so, this would not be the last time that Indianapolis would host the AFC Championship. Three years later, they hosted the 2009 AFC Championship in January of 2010 against the New York Jets, and the Colts won that game 30-17. The Colts had a lot more heads up with this one. They started the season off 14-0, they were the number one seed, and they got on their feet wet from hosting the absolute travesty of the 2006 AFC Championship from a ticket-selling perspective. So they had their feet wet, 
and the Colts jet ski went off without a hitch from a ticket selling perspective. No controversy there, it was as smooth as possible. But still, the Colts Patriots scheme? Not so much. As a side note, the man who made the game-winning interception for the Colts to send them to Super Bowl 41 was none other than Marlon Jackson, as in this man right here. Just a cool little piece of memorabilia from the studio. There's an old saying that goes, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And if ever that applied for a football team, when it came to selling tickets for a conference championship and for their biggest scheme in franchise history since playing in that city, it was with this scheme right here and the 2006 AFC Championship. The odds were stacked against them to make it. The city had never hosted the game before, and no number three seed had ever been in a position to host the game. But even despite all of that, that's not an excuse to not have a contingency plan. They truly had nothing in place. They had nothing that indicated even the slightest bit of confidence and ability to put this event on from a ticket-selling perspective, as they proceeded to create a convoluted system, lie to their fans about how it worked, create hostility amongst the crowd for no reason, create a mass gathering and a public safety issue for no reason, waste everyone's time, and misrepresent the number of tickets that were made available in the first place, either by lying or by truly not knowing their own numbers. And honestly, I don't know which option would be worse. Because when it came to the ticket buying process for the 2006 AFC Championship, what the Indianapolis Colts did was a load of horse, well, you know. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL Trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.